All right. Well, morning, everyone. Welcome to session 9A, treatment uh, and focusing on nutrient removal. And just a note, Anna is over there in that back table collecting uh, your CEU forms. So if you guys want to run those over to Anna before it talks, that's great. And then she'll have them there for you to pick up when you leave. So our first presentation is using, using CANAP for denitrification and winter nitrification. Um, Eric Roundy and Marvin Fielding. Eric has nearly 20 years of experience in the design and evaluation of wastewater treatment systems. He has a master's degree in environmental engineering from the University of Illinois, a bachelor's degree from the University of Nebraska, and a master's degree from Mississippi State. Licensed professional engineer in five states, including Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. Then Marvin has 20 years of experience in planning, design, and construction of administration of municipal infrastructure projects. He enjoys helping communities find cost-effective solutions to their wastewater and drinking water needs. He graduated from Utah State University with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and is a licensed professional engineer in Idaho, Wyoming, and Utah. And they're with Keller Engineers. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to kind of lay out the background and uh, the setup for the trial demonstration that's been going on in Rigby for the last couple of years. Uh, Rigby is a small community between Rexburg and Idaho Falls, about right in the middle. Uh, they've had a lot of population uh, growth recently. A couple fun facts about Rigby. They are the Idaho State 5A football champions for the last two years, or with COVID in the middle. And uh, Rigby was the childhood home of Philo T. Farnsworth, who was the inventor of television. He had the idea for television while he was out in the potato field in Rigby one day. So kind of a fun thing. Um, the Rigby treatment plant originally was a five cell wastewater lagoon system. And uh, with increasing BOD and TSS requirements, uh, they hired us to help them do a study and you can see uh, then back in 2010, well, prior to that time, talked to the mayor a couple of days ago, who was mayor at the time, and he remembered uh, the EPA got a call from a concerned citizen that Rigby was intentionally dumping sewage into the groundwater. And so the mayor remembered the day when EPA enforcement agents showed up with badges and guns to figure out what was happening at the Rigby wastewater treatment plant. So it was an exciting time. And, uh, in the community. But uh, in 2010, uh, we designed a secondary treatment plant with oxidation ditches, clarifiers, uh, UV disinfection, and uh, with discharge to the dry bed, which you can see in the upper left hand corner of the photo there. And dry bed, the dry bed was originally a, a channel of the Snake River, but has long since been controlled with head gates at the front for irrigation. And so that, um, uh, but that's the, the receiving water that the city discharges to. Uh, here's a flow schematic of their process. Um, they do, they have a, a quarter inch bar screen and grit removal in the headworks. They do use a gravity belt thickener and, and a belt press for solids handling. And then their solids, they haul them to the landfill. Um, in their most recent permit, 2017, they got a new uh, ammonia limit that was more stringent than what they could meet at their existing plant. So they, they uh, that being 0.65 milligrams per liter. And so they asked us to update their study and look at alternatives to help them come into compliance. Um, one of the challenges was their low wintertime uh, influent temperatures that get as low as eight degrees C or lower. And uh, until just recently, they only had one operator at the plant. Uh, working with DEQ, they were able to extend their compliance schedule one year, in fact, to accommodate this trial demonstration that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, this shows historic uh, ammonia concentrations. The lower uh, red line represents the winter time Ammonia, uh, ammonia limits, and the upper bar is the summertime ammonia limits, or what they what they will be going forward. And so you can see that they 
would have had a hard time meeting those uh, ammonia limits with their existing plant. So in the study, we considered a number of alternatives, including wastewater reuse for a community the size of Rigby, that would have been really land intensive, would have required about 450 acres of farmland. And so that idea was uh, ruled out. We, we looked at regionalization uh, being right in the middle of Idaho Falls and Rexburg, which are the larger wastewater treatment plants on either side. Uh, they're about 15 miles either way, so, so that really wasn't feasible either. We did look at, as I mentioned, uh, the dry bed is controlled in the, uh, for irrigation, and, and that was part of what led to their uh, strict ammonia limit, is they had no flow in the, in the wintertime. And so we looked at extending the discharge to the Snake River about four miles away, which would have given them some relief on their ammonia limit but they would have still had a pneumonia limit and still needed to do uh, plant improvements. So, so then we looked at uh, multiple uh, ammonia treatment alternatives. Uh, the first being to, to build larger oxidation ditches using the same technology that they, that they currently have. Uh, foremost for us was keeping the process simple with what they were familiar with being that they only had one operator. Uh, this was a, a known technology to them and was, and was working really well. Uh, a, another variation of that was to build larger oxidation ditches, but add improved aeration, more efficient aeration with diffusers and blowers. Again, a known technology, um, but a more expensive option and, and would require some changes at the plant. Uh, we looked at the uh, Biomag system and, and IFAS as other alternatives, and then also the Nuvota mobile organic biofilm process, which is what, which is what they ended up implementing and doing a, a full-scale trial demonstration over the last couple of years. Uh, the process is mobile in that it, the media circulates through the entire process of the oxidation ditches and the clarifiers. Uh, the media is organic. Uh, we have, a, Eric has over here, a, a couple of the pucks. It uh, resembles uh, oatmeal, uh, but it's, it's organic media, uh, plant-based. And, uh, and then the, uh, it has a large surface area with, because of, the, of how it's ground up. And so the, the biofilm forms around similar to a granular activated sludge uh, more than more than a, it's more uh, sorry closer to a granular activated sludge process than an IFAS process uh, so just some key points key differences uh, but again we wanted to keep the process simple so the the oxidation ditches were were simple what the operators were used to but this was the highest operating cost. Um, the Nuvoda, the, the key with the Nuvoda was that, that they were potentially could meet their ammonia removal requirements within their existing footprint. And uh, they, they also uh, potentially had better settling in the secondary clarifiers, which turned out to be the case. But this process was uh, a relatively new process. So we did recommend pilot testing uh, this shows the, a comparison of the cost, the, um, the Nuvota alternative, because it would fit in the footprint, and I'll describe more what that process was, but within their current footprint was the least cost uh, alternative with the other oxidation ditches alternatives uh, going up from there. Uh, a little bit more about the the NAF media, it's a relative of hemp, but it ground into the consistency of uh, one millimeter particles. It has a high surface area, high absorptivity, and uh, they, they estimate, uh, Nuvota estimated that they would need to replace that Nuvota, that NAF media at, a, at about 2% per year. Uh, as I mentioned, it was a relatively new process, but they did have 
some good data from their Moorfield, West Virginia plant. That uh, plant was a, a joint venture between the city and JBS Pilgrims, which is a chicken processing plant. And so um, they, uh, prior to implementing Nevoda, we're using a lot of chemicals to handle the, the load, the variable loading conditions. And they, those uh, chemicals were contributing to upsets. Uh, but this, this slide shows what, what happened after the, uh, they implemented the Nevoda process. You can see that the sludge volume index dropped way down uh, the lower right hand corner there. Uh, the solids retention time, they went from 25 days down to five days as a target. And then the upper right there, you can see the process upsets, the, the long bars at the top show when they had process upsets. And it also shows the chemicals they were using prior to implementing Nevoda. So after implementing Nevoda, they were able to uh, significantly reduce their chemical usage. So we used, we, we uh, investigated this data at about five years of data that we used before implementing this trial demonstration in Rigby. So um, the Rigby trial demonstration began, it was a full-scale trial demonstration began October 13th, 2020, and initially just ran through March 31st of 2021. Uh, we began with a fill rate of 1.26%. Uh, and used a 0.5 millimeter drum screen to recover the media. I'll talk more about that in a second, but, but we tested for more than just ammonia. We looked at the, the other uh, standard parameters uh, and also toxicity. We were looking at mixing and aeration requirements and uh, the overall capacity of the plant. Uh, this schematic shows where the uh, NAF media was introduced. So in the oxidation ditches and then carries into the clarifiers um, and, uh, and then the RAS is recir recirculated uh, back up to the head of the plant. And um, this, then, this then is, uh, is the screen building, which was constructed to protect the screen and that uh, process from freezing in the winter. So the waste activated sludge is pumped up to the rotary drum screen in this building. The um, PNAF is recovered from the waste activated sludge and dropped back into the oxidation ditch. And then the, the WAS is pumped back to the solids handling building. So um, to give you an idea of what effect this process had on operations, uh, Wintertime, Rigby is cold and snowy. Um, I'm gonna, we uh, invited the operator to come with us, but uh, he had a trip planned. So, but anyway, the during this time, during the trial demonstration, the lower, lowest recorded influent temperature was 7.7 .7 degrees Celsius. Um, Nuvota recommended a maintaining the dissolved oxygen between two and a half, three milligrams per liter with a, a target solids retention time of three to seven days in the summer and eight to 10 days in the winter. So their MLSS concentration in the summer with CANAF was 3,200 to 3,500 milligrams per liter. Without CANAF, 2,000 to 2,500 milligrams per liter. And then in the winter was 42 to 4,500 milligrams per liter with CANAF and 2,500 to 3,000 without. Um, so the operator noticed when the CANAF was first introduced that uh, bits and pieces would flake off and he could see that in the, in the dewatered sludge, but this, this, after a couple of years, is no longer an issue. He, he learned that he needed to run the RAS at uh, recycle rate at 100%. He noticed that anything less than that that over time his RAS recycle rate would um, decrease over a period of a couple of days. And so uh, he noticed that the, the media was settling out in his RAS lines and to clear them, he'd have to bump his, uh, his RAS rate way up, clear the lines and then reset his RAS recirculation rate. 
but he found if he maintained it at 100%, then he, he didn't have that issue. Uh, so this is a picture of the, the uh, rotary drum screen in the, in the screen building. Uh, screen maintenance is fairly easy. One thing you did find that uh, if the, if the uh, plant water screens plugged off that um, it, this, this drum screen required about 30 gallons per minute to, to wash the canap. And if, if that, he lost his spray water, then, then um, the screen would blind off and he couldn't waste. This was a particularly a problem over the weekends. You can see there in the, the photo, we've got some spin filters. Um, it, this is a temporary situation. But uh, when if those would plug off over the weekend, then he found he couldn't waste. So um, this is a picture of that uh, drum screen in operation. But a, a simple process. So overall, the the Nuvota was a fairly simple process to implement. So I'll uh, turn the time to Rick uh, to Eric to talk about the results of the trial demonstration. I get the fun part. I get to talk about the results. Um, so uh, as Marvin mentioned, uh, the, the trial originally was from October through March. Um, so this first slide here is, is showing uh, when the CANAF was introduced the oxidation ditches, which was October 13th. So the black line is the influent temperature. Um, so as you can see, it, it started out about 16 degrees C, and then uh, in January, it was down to about eight degrees C. Um, and the green line at the bottom is the effluent ammonia. Um, and uh, that effluent ammonia, it, it was, uh, so the plant was was nitrifying at, at that time. And um, one interesting note is it, it was continuing to nitrify, even though in past years, the uh, plant had, had lost nitrification during this time. So um, we had some good results uh, that we saw through the uh, end of January. This was kind of the accumulate or acclimatization period uh, for the uh, canaf. So um, at the end of, there we go. Okay, so at the end of January, beginning of February, uh, we switched to sending the influent to both oxidation ditches to instead send uh, all the flow to one oxidation ditch. And so with that additional loading, uh, we saw a very immediate response. And the ammonia spiked up uh, that same day and um, continued for uh, the next month. Uh, there, there were uh, a few results that were good. Um, however, definitely was not in control. And so uh, what we decided to do was transfer some of the um, CANAF from the other offline oxidation ditch. We were we were uh, intermittently feeding that ditch with some influent to keep it alive. Um, so we, we transferred over that CANAF and um, we immediately saw some stable results, uh, but the trial ended two weeks later. So we didn't, we felt good uh, about uh, overall, the trial was successful in that uh, we made it through the winter, um, and we were able to achieve the results, but we weren't able to achieve the 2040 design um, uh, results that we were hoping. Um, however, we did have some, uh, some uh, a positive outlook. If maybe if we could increase that CANAF fill rate, that we could uh, uh, continue the pilot and continue to see uh, if if the effluent ammonia could, could achieve the results through another winter. So that's what the city decided to do was continue the pilot. Um, so we, 
the city switched back to running through two oxidation ditches. Um, the summer period was was uh, uh, not a period of concern. Um, so to continue the trial, uh, next slide shows the BOD results uh, during the pilot. Um, again, once once things stabilized, uh, you know, BOD was also um, had some good results, especially with the two basins. But once we switched uh, to sending all the influent through one oxidation ditch, uh, we saw similar uh, process instability, similar to the ammonia. Um, and and then again, it, it dropped down uh, once we increased the fill rate. So, uh, so that was ammonia and BOD, and then TSS. Um, one of the the main uh, benefits from the CANAF was, uh, as as was seen with the Moorfield uh, installation, that the uh, the SVIs really dropped, um, and uh, so. We, we saw similar results and good settleability uh, throughout this trial period. Uh, in fact, the table at the bottom shows, it compares previous years of effluent TSS with the, um, the period when, when things were in control during the pilot and, and the effluent TSS were, was the lowest that, that the city had seen. Um, one interesting note, uh, even though the ammonium BOD really spiked up. Um, the effluent TSS uh, during that period where just one oxidation ditch was online uh, remained uh, less than 10 milligrams per liter. So still some good uh, settleability during that period. Um, one thing we also wanted to check, uh, you know, uh, going back to when this uh, project uh, started, uh, we this was about 2018 when we started having conversations with Novota. And uh, one of the benefits were, was that uh, nutrient removal might be a possibility um, with that. So we wanted to, te to test the total nitrogen and total phosphorus in the effluent. Um, however, as, as Marvin mentioned, uh, the oxidation ditches are very aerobic um, and and this seemed to have impacted any potential for nutrient removal uh, as uh, the magenta and aqua um, lines show that the total nitrogen uh, really didn't decrease uh, during the test. And similarly, the total phosphorus, uh, we didn't really see a removal of phosphorus. We tested pH um, with the additional nitrification that was achieved, we wanted to make sure that, um, especially with a Rigby's uh, lower limit being six and a half, that it stayed above that. With uh, the CANAF, uh, it's very absorptive. So we wanted to make sure that there weren't any toxicity effects. And uh, so that was tested during the trial and, and no uh, toxic effects were noticed. So some other tests that we did um, as, as we're kind of seen or uh, shown in the previous slide about the cost estimates uh, during the planning study, uh, we, we uh, were not positive if additional aeration or mixing uh, would be needed uh, for the Moorfield installation, additional uh, aeration or mixing was not required. And so we wanted to test both of those. Uh, the difficulty with Rigby is there's no good spot to test mixing. And um, so once the city took a, a basin down, um, we found that a lot of the CANAF had settled on the inside of the basins uh, along that center wall. We were, they were testing the outside of the basins and, and seeing good uniformity there. Um, however, um, we were very concerned once, once we took a, a ditch down. And, uh, but it, it was also an opportunity that if, if we could improve the mixing, then perhaps we could improve the, the performance. 
Um, also during the test, we, um, we had, uh, we checked on the aeration transfer efficiency to see if there was any impact to that. Um, had Dave Redman come out and do some testing and there didn't seem to be any impact uh, specifically with adding the FNAF, still maintain a good oxygen transfer rate. Um, so we, we had a couple things uh, going into the, the second year of piloting, um, increasing the CANAF fill rate, and then also uh, improving the mixing. So uh, the city installed first uh, one temporary mixer um, in, on one side of the oxidation ditch. Um, and then we, we uh, the city continued uh, the testing um, with that additional mixer and at uh, the higher fill rate. There's some additional uh, testing results. Again, uh, the black line is the influent temperature and the green line is uh, the effluent ammonia. So you've seen the, the first half of this chart and then picking things up kind of in the middle. Um, when we installed, or the city installed the first mixer was about this time last year. Um, and uh, then they, they transferred uh, to, to one ditch, um, you know, right, right when the temperature was dropping. And uh, as, as can be seen in the chart, uh, the effluent ammonia really uh, started dropping immediately and was able to uh, stay within that, that uh, below 0.65 uh, milligrams per liter during the remainder of the test um, through this, this year. Um, the city did experience some, some power outages and uh, those had an impact, um, but when power was restored, uh, things immediately dropped back down. We did do some knowing that mixing was an issue uh, we did some uh, testing with the city on seeing what mixing was required to keep thing in, keep the media in suspension. And what we found was uh, really a second mixer was needed. Uh, even with the one mixer, we still had deposition on the other side of the wall. We were able to, to mix one side of the basin with one mixer, but a second mixer was needed. So, um, so two mixers uh, were installed. So uh, uh, here's uh, bio, effluent BOD, effluent TSS. Um, again, picking it up from the, the middle of the chart, uh, BOD and TSS uh, were very consistently uh, below the limit, except for uh, during the, the power outages. Um, and Kind of continuing with the, the chart on the right, uh, the effluent TSS was, was consistently low uh, at 4.3 milligrams per liter. Here's kind of a summary of uh, where the city, uh, where the treatment plant was at before the trial and, and with, with the MOB process added. So originally the plant was not designed for, um, for full nitrification. Um, and so uh, uh, it was really uh, limiting for the city. And then kind of the second row from the bottom shows with the Nevoda process, uh, they were essentially able to triple their nitrification capacity in the existing ditches. Um, however, it, that still wasn't quite uh, to achieve the 2040 uh, design capacity that was required. So the city is continuing to test and uh, you know, look at is, is there additional nitrification capacity that can be achieved. So with that, we'll take any questions. Just a reminder, it's a live stream. So if anyone has questions, there's a mic right there in the middle, or I'd be happy to jog this over.
All right. Yeah. Are there any supply issues with um, getting the media? So um, there's there's currently just one manufacturer, um, and we we haven't seen any supply issues. They do um, they do recommend uh, about five percent. Uh, having that on hand each year to replace what gets lost. So um, usually for, for Rigby, that's a, about one super sack per, per year. So yeah, and just, uh, it doesn't get lost all at once. So there's quite a bit of lag in there that you can add more. And that's one of the, uh, the nice things about um, an IFAS system is that you can add additional media for additional capacity later. So um, like for Rigby, they have the potential to double uh, the amount of media that they can have in the basin based on the vote as well. When, when, you re when you replace the media, did you just have it on a schedule or how did you know when you needed to add more? Um, yeah, it's just on a schedule. Yep. So, um, yeah, like it, they have not had to replace any media yet, um, but they are monitoring that about weekly. I'm sorry if I missed, but uh, what was the in point? Uh, I mean, sorry, F point ammonia concentration um, before CANAF was added? Sorry if I missed. So, the effluent ammonia before, before the CANAF, CANAF was, was added? added? Yeah. So, in previous years, um, in 2018 and 19, um, during certain months, it would jump over the 0.65 uh, milligram per liter limit in the winter. So, Thanks. yeah, it would. We would still see uh, partial nitrification in the winter. Uh, however, there just there would be periods that it wouldn't be able to achieve that. Total nitrogen was about the same. Yeah, yeah. Total nitrogen was about the same. Oh. Yeah, year round. I, I had a question, so I saw that it looked like it built up pretty good in the oxidation ditch. Um, and I see that extra mixing helped. Have, and you guys might not know this. Have, have other projects had build up issues with that CANAF that they've um, tried? We have not seen that. And so, um, you know, we, uh, as I mentioned, we anticipated that there might be an issue. Um, however, uh, before spending that money on the pilot, uh, we wanted to see if that might be what. Any other questions? I'd, I'd be happy to walk this mic over. Great. Well, thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs>